Thank you all for joining us today and, and tuning in for an important update on coronavirus where we are in Colorado. Uh, I want to start today by acknowledging the life and the work of retired fire paramedic Paul Carey. Paul is a Colorado hero that we celebrate his life. He volunteered to travel in New York City, the worst corona outbreak in the world in New York City, 15,000 lives lost. He said, you know what? I'm going to go serve on the front line as a paramedic and save lives. And he knew. He knew that he was putting his own life at risk. He knew that he might contract the virus. He knew that he was high risk at age 66. He left Colorado, went to New York, began working April 1st. Sure enough, he was later diagnosed with coronavirus. And Paul passed away. Uh, on April 30th at the age of 66 after contracting coronavirus in his line of work, fighting to save lives of our fellow Americans in New York City. Uh, yesterday, his body was brought home to Colorado for the last time. Paul Carey served his community and our nation heroically for years. And he still worked as an ambulance medic even after retiring from the fire department. He was a leader, a steady hand in stormy seas. He would often use his wisdom and his patience to guide younger medics, helping to train the next generation of EMTs and paramedics and other first responders. And when one of the greatest crises of our lifetime struck, he didn't hesitate to raise his hand and volunteer and travel thousands of miles from his home to help his fellow Americans in need. He knew he was risking his own life and safety, just as all, as our, all of our medical frontline workers do every day. But Paul did it, just like so many of our other medical frontline workers, because you know what? He saw people in need, and he raised his hand and said, I'm up for the challenge of helping. What a statement of character. Character that we see from our first responders in Colorado, across the United States, and across the world every day in this coronavirus crisis, putting themselves in danger so the rest of us don't have to. I can never express how grateful I and the people of Colorado are for Paul's service and so many others who have stepped up across the board. Paul dedicated his life to the service of others and he will be greatly missed and his legacy will be remembered. On a personal level, of course, our hearts go out to Paul's friends and family and loved ones. We grieve with them today, just as we grieve for all 848 Coloradans who've lost their lives tragically uh, due to the coronavirus outbreak. I encourage the people of Colorado to honor Paul Carey's memory and honor all of our first responders by continuing to take this crisis seriously, wear masks, when you're in public, when you're going to stores, when you're on trails passing people. Uh, and of course, continue the social distancing, continue to stay at least six feet away from others and avoid unnecessary social interactions with others. This is what we owe to those who are risking their lives every day on the front lines of this crisis. It's a small ask, it's what we all need to do, it's our individual responsibility to not just say it, but show that we are grateful for Paul Carey's sacrifice and the sacrifice of so many others. We're now at 16,870 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Colorado, 848 tragic deaths. Our hearts go out to the loved ones of all those who've been lost. And I want to highlight that with 16,878 cases, remember the likely number is several times that. That's the number of diagnosed cases. Uh, I'm going to talk today about how we're going to make the testing more available and you can find out where in your area, in your city, in your county, you can get testing if you want it. But if you're exhibiting flu-like symptoms, stay home and self-isolate until four or five days after the last symptom subsides, right? The last symptom may be fever and then you're, you're feeling good, wait four or five days before you go out and encounter others. The last symptom may be after fever and maybe you have a sore throat or cough after the fever subsided. If it's COVID-19 coronavirus, you are likely still contagious. Wait four or five days till after the last symptom uh, has subsided before you go out. And of course, for anything that needs urgent medical care, seek urgent medical care. If you do have coronavirus, the good news is 
that nine in 10 people can recover at home without any medical intervention. Uh, but the bad news is one in 10 will need that hospital bed to have a chance, a fighting chance to save your life. In most cases, simply oxygen treatment. In some extreme cases, uh, a ventilator inter intervention to help uh, with respiration. Uh, but what's important is you avoid interactions with others if you have flu-like symptoms. Uh, we're gonna get through this together as a state. And I know that this really, just as it called upon what was best in Paul Kerry, this crisis calls on the best of all of us. And it's those individual decisions that Coloradans are making every day that will really determine how we get through this and protect our health and grow our economy and return to normalcy. The decision to say, you know what, I have a neighbor who's 76 years old, I'm gonna call and see if I can go grocery shopping for them and bring the groceries to their door so they don't have to go out because they're at greater risk. It's that decision uh, to uh, always try to be at least six feet from others uh, when you're out and doing the activities you need to do. Uh, it's a decision to make sure you're safe in your workplace. And if you see any violations of workplace safety, that you report those promptly, because it's not just putting your life in danger, it's also putting the lives of your customers and suppliers and others in danger. Uh, today is the first day back at work for many Coloradans. Um, stores opened uh, a couple days ago in much of Colorado. Uh, it's also important that, of course, we obey the law, which means our local orders. There's some communities in the Denver metro area uh, that have another four or five days before stores are opening and people are going back to the office. But in much of Colorado, uh, stores are open. Now, stores are not something new. Stores have been open throughout this crisis, right? The grocery stores, the pharmacies. Uh, now the other retailers are open too. And they should have some of those same precautions that we've seen at the grocery stores. Their employees should all be wearing masks if they're handling product, uh, wearing glove. You know, I went to the pharmacy the other day and I saw that uh, they had implemented one of the best practices and they had a fiberglass screen um, between where the checkout was. Many of them have paperless checkout. Uh, they're really doing their best and they're doing the best for you, their customers. They're doing their best for their employees uh, and they're doing the best for all of us because we have no option, we have to get this right. We have to get this right as a state. Uh, having a humanitarian crisis and mass deaths on our hand is not a valid option. And preventing people from earning an income and destroying our economy is not a valid option. We have to, and we are, uh, finding a better way, as states across the country, as countries across the world are doing, to be able to engage in the activities that we need to as people in as safe a way as possible, a way that is fulfilling psychologically, fulfilling economically, and fulfilling socially, at the same time meeting the public health goals of reducing the safety risk and making sure that for anybody who contracts coronavirus or any other non-coronavirus condition like a heart attack or stroke, there is hospital capacity for you. Uh, and that has been our goal throughout this crisis and why we've taken, made the successful effort to reduce the spread uh, and, and lower uh, the increases through the success that Coloradans had staying at home uh, for 30 days. And as you venture out, it's a time not for anxiety and not for fear, but a time for justified caution. And with that justified caution, and by wearing masks and avoiding social interactions and keeping your distance from people, uh, we're gonna get through this as a state, as a nation, uh, and across the world. As you can see, the daily growth rate is continuing to decline. As of yesterday, the growth rate was down to 1.4% for the increase in coronavirus cases in Colorado. And we're continuing to see similar results in the hospitalization rate. The growth rate yesterday was 0.1% in hospitalization. Now, we're glad things are moving in the right direction, and we all should. As Coloradans, as Americans, we should all be proud. But that also means that there are still coronavirus cases in Colorado being rushed to the hospital every day. Some will walk out on their own two feet and tragically, uh, some will not. And this is likely to remain the case for the foreseeable future in Colorado, in the United States, and across the world. Uh, it's time that we exercise our individual responsibility and take ownership of the fact that we need to, do, we need to exercise caution in our everyday lives to do the best that we can to keep ourselves and our loved ones safe in a sustainable way that'll last many months. We all need to do our part for the positive momentum that Colorado has to continue, especially as we enter this new safer at home stage. You know, it's easy to live in a black and white world, right? You're staying at home or you're going out. The truth lies in the gray in between for the coming months. Uh, we know that 
Coloradans can't be expected or asked to stay at home indefinitely. No, nobody can. People have to earn a living. People have to have psychological and social fulfillment. So too, we have to make sure that Coloradans aren't going back to the way we lived in January or February, or we could be on the same tragic trajectory that we successfully stopped, that you successfully stopped, by staying at home and limiting your social interactions so successfully for a month. As many of you know, today, Monday, May 4th, business offices are returning to up to 50% in-person capacity. Now, we're encouraging all employers to allow everybody to telecommute who can, right? Many businesses are extending their blanket work-from-home policies even more, including companies like the Foundry Group, headed by Brad Fell, the chairman of the state's innovation response team's private sector task force. I'm also proud that our state of Colorado has 62% of our workers telecommuting, and yet we're continuing to offer all the critical state services that people need. And we're looking at how we can maximize telecommuting even more going forward. Uh, it's an opportunity for companies and for the state to save money on office space, on maintenance, on commuting costs, uh, as well as institutionalizing this kind of social distancing that can help save lives during this outbreak and help us return to economic growth and opportunity sooner rather than later. I also want to remind folks that no vulnerable individuals, folks over 65, people with underlying health conditions, can be compelled to go back to a workplace where they're performing work in close proximity of others. For our older Coloradans, May looks just like April. It's not yet time, it's not yet safe enough to visit the grandkids, to have a family reunion, to fill up your, the church pews for folks in their 70s and 80s. We want to make sure you're here, not just to see us this next month, but to see us for decades to come. And, and we need to make that sacrifice, right? You need to take responsibility and say, you know what, I want to see my 10-year-old granddaughter and grandson graduate from high school in eight years. And to do that, and to make sure that I'm there, I have to forego seeing them during this month of May, and that's tough. That's tough. Thankfully, we have technology. We have FaceTime and Zoom and Google Chat and all these wonderful ways that people can be with one another without being with one another. You know, my parents are uh, 76, and uh, they talk to the grandkids almost every day, Marlon and my kids, who are 8 and 5, and they can't be with them in person. We don't want to put them at that risk, and they're staying at home. Uh, but nevertheless, they're able to have those authentic communications that are so important. And I know that when we come out the other end, uh, their relationship will be even stronger. Uh, and I think that that's something that we all need to focus on. Just the fact that we can't be with somebody in person doesn't mean that we can't be with them virtually in a meaningful way. We know that as we begin to loosen these restrictions on our economy, finally, and, and, and folks can go back to earning a living and uh, so returning to society, we want to make sure we give very strong uh, public health and public safety guidelines to individuals, to businesses, to nonprofits, uh, so that we can be successful as a state. Be successful in saving lives, be successful in minimizing the economic disruption, be successful in bouncing back and showing resiliency. I want to give you an update on the outreach. Normally, these kinds of, this kind of process would take weeks or months. And I charged our team, I said, we're going to do this in a week. And we had to do it in a week, and we did do it in a week, and we had to listen to voices during that week. Um, and so we heard from 35 retail associations, 1,100 folks that, are, that, that cut hair or, or do nails. We heard from 300 ch chambers of commerce and 350 hospitals, and we heard from 300 uh, junior colleges and colleges and 340 child care providers and 200 local governments, 300 real estate agents, through a series of webinars that we did and through online comments that they submitted. And, and that's not even counting all of the one-off questions that people have left on my voicemail and my cabinet's voicemail. Uh, we've received thousands of comments to make sure that the safety guidelines correspond to reality in Colorado. Health reality, an economic reality. What does that mean? Health reality? Things have to be as safe as possible. Economic reality? That doesn't mean you can tell a store that's living on thin margins, oh, you got to buy some $10,000 UV machine to reopen. That doesn't do them any good. They can't make uh, a living or have their employees or meet payroll with that. So we're, we meet them where they are. Which means, you know, decals on the floor, right? You got to have the hand sanitizer there. You have to have a way to ensure that people aren't crowding in the store. 
all of those different things. And I'm encouraged by the extremely high level of participation. Coloradans are eager to share their own wisdom and knowledge from their own lives about how we can keep our fellow Coloradans safe. And for this to work, for us to be able to move forward rather than backward, businesses and individuals need to take this deadly seriously because this is deadly serious. So thank everybody for doing your part. Keep your suggestions and ideas flowing to your county health department, to us, to your cities. We're all in this together and we need the very best ideas from the people of this state about how we can keep people healthy and as safe as possible and still make sure that we can continue to function in a sustainable way, economically, socially, psychologically. And along with all those ideas that came in and the safety, very reasonable safety guidance that went out, we also want to make sure that we have the right implementation of that safety guidance, that we have compliance with that safety guidance. I mean, when people go to a store, they know that that store is following those protocols. When they go to work in an office, they want to make sure that office is following those safety protocols and doing what they can to keep them safe. On April 24th, I announced that we would be establishing the Governor's Advisory Committee for Cooperation and Implementation to ensure that we're hitting the benchmarks that we've set and that the rules are enforced so we can sustain and grow upon this new normal for the long haul. The board advises the governor, my chief of staff, CDPHE on policies and how we can design uh, things that maximize social distancing and work in the real world, uh, focus on how we can work with local governments and local public health entities and local businesses to make sure that we have real compliance of the meaningful steps that the state is, state is taking and that local health departments are taking to protect uh, us from uh, outbreaks and keep us as safe as possible. We need to make sure that communities across our state, diverse communities, small towns in the mountains, small towns in the eastern plains, large cities, suburban areas, are all represented so we can make this community work for everybody. So we wanted representatives of a county commissioner in a county with more than a quarter million residents, a county commissioner in a county with fewer than a quarter million residents, the mayor of a city with 100,000 people or more, and the mayor of a smaller town, local public health representatives from large areas and small areas, uh, a sheriff, a police chief, a fire chief, and a representative from our very own Economic Recovery and Stabilization Council, chaired by Federico Peña, which is doing amazing work, a great bipartisan group that's already began several weeks ago, thinking about how we can have a strong and robust economic recovery here in Colorado, uh, along with meeting the public health needs. Today I'm proud to announce the bipartisan membership of that board that will be advising me and our chief of staff and our team. For the county commissioner of a large county, Steve Johnson from Larimer County. County commissioner from a smaller county, Hillary Cooper from San Miguel. For the mayor of a large city, uh, Nick Gratisar from Pueblo. From the mayor of a smaller city, Barbara Bynum from Montrose. Uh, from a local public health of a large area, Robert McDonald with the city and county of Denver. For a local public health agency for a smaller area, Heath Harmon and Eagle, and I want to congratulate Eagle County and Heath for their amazing work moving from an initial hot spot in our state to really being on a strong path uh, towards recovery. Uh, Sheriff Jeffrey Schrader from Jefferson County and Police Chief Gary Krieger from Broomfield. Uh, we also have added Thomas DeMint from the Pooter uh, Fire Department and Kyle Martinez from Olathe who is the representative of our Economic Recovery and Stabilization Council to give a voice uh, from the private sector in these considerations. Our internal members uh, of this work to make sure that these, the public safety and these, all these can, things that, that, that look great on paper actually happen in the real world to keep you safe and keep our businesses going strong is my Chief of Staff Lisa Coffin, Department of Public Safety Executive Director Stan Hilke, uh, the Public Health Director Jill Ryan, and DORA Director Patty Salazar. So they're going to really be a team with these folks from across the state, communities large and small, uh, to make sure that we can, in a very real way, uh, keep people as safe as possible while we, go, while we go about our lives. I also want to talk about how Coloradans can access testing because uh, there's a lot more access than there was and there's gonna be even more in the future. I was on a call with the vice president this morning and we discussed our cooperation with testing. I talked to the uh, CEO of a testing company on a regular basis where, where we, as you know, we had 100,000 tests arrive from South Korea. We have additional swabs and materials arriving really almost every day because we know that testing provides critical information to help inform both your actions as individuals, although if you have flu-like symptoms, you should self-isolate regardless of whether you have coronavirus or not, 
as well as our actions as we monitor and respond decisively and boldly to hotspots and to prevent the spread of the virus in Colorado. Our goal is to continue to expand testing and of course to share that information with you as testing becomes more and more available. In order to hit our goals, uh, we have a few things that we're working on all in tandem. It's not just about the supply of testing equipment and materials, which we briefed you on and we are excited about where we are as a state, but we also need to provide a variety of sites across the state to meet you where you are if you need testing. And there's four types of testing sites in Colorado that we're involved with in supporting where you can get tested for coronavirus. Of course, you can be tested at private sector hospitals and healthcare facilities through your doctor at the hospital. You can be tested at local community-based testing sites. Most of them are headed up by local public health agencies, but we also provide support for some of the larger ones when needed, and we give supplies to the county health departments. We do targeted testing for outbreaks and at-risk populations. For instance, we're doing testing at senior centers across our state, starting with the larger ones, in concert with the Colorado National Guard. We're testing asymptomatic workers, meaning perfectly healthy, the folks that go in every day to work at the senior facilities, because many younger people don't show the symptoms and yet they're contagious and it can be deadly, it is deadly for older Coloradans. So we've tested um, uh, at a number of senior facilities already. We're doing more in partnership with CSU uh, and we wanna remove people that are contagious but don't have symptoms temporarily from the workforce to help prevent additional outbreaks that are deadly at our senior facilities and nursing homes. And of course, we also have a state collaboration with many private sector partners like Kroger, Safeway, many others to make testing available. I'm also announcing that we're launching a new map of local community-based testing sites. Uh, we are providing support, supplies, guidance, logistical support where needed to help stand up local testing sites across the state. It's particularly important in rural areas where private providers are limited in number and capacity or, or, or simply might be too far away. Uh, several weeks ago, we distributed a playbook to local public health agencies to support them in their work. And so and we've asked them each to submit a request to the state. And we've gotten requests from 59 counties. And the state lab has already completed readiness, readiness assessments and approved testing plans for 40 sites. We've sent supplies to all 40 sites. And as more come online, we'll be sending more supplies to them to meet people where they are in your area, in your neighborhood. In addition to the 40 state-supported testing sites, we've also uh, given supplies to many of the large hospital systems and clinics in the Denver metro area, including Denver Health, National Jewish, Children's Hospital, and Kaiser. And the state lab has distributed over 22,000 testing kits across the state, just in the last couple weeks. Today we're highlighting a new tool in our COVID-19 website, which is a map of all the community-based testing sites throughout the state. So you can check it out at covid19.colorado.gov. We have an excellent blog there. We have up-to-date statistics, and now we have a testing map where you can click on testing for COVID at covid19.colorado.gov, and you can find all the community testing sites with a map, and we have a screenshot on the next slide of what that looks like. Um, so you can see, for instance, that there's testing sites that are set up and operated with support from the state, many by local health agencies, agencies, uh, we are trying to compile as much information as we can in each one, including how long is it running for, who can go. Uh, here's an example from Clear Creek County, right, Idaho Springs area. Uh, phone number, address, hours of operation, who can get tested, do you need an appointment, do you need a doctor's note? These are things people want to know. And rather than make you go through endless uh, research and phone calls, especially while you're ill, if you are ill, we're just making all this information available right for you, covid19.colorado.gov. As we get more information, we'll add it. Right now, there's at least 20 testing sites listed. Uh, we're going to be continuing to add more and update this tool as soon as the sites are ready and the information is accurate and entered. Now, it's important to remember that these sites are not the only route to testing. These are the community-based testing sites that are meant to fill in the gaps where you can't get to a hospital or don't have a doctor. The, for most of us, the, your doctor is the gatekeeper to testing, and hospitals and clinics, all private providers, do a lot of it. But we've also had great success uh, with drive-through and community-based clinics, and that's why we're really focused on making sure you know where they are so you can access them um, if you need testing. And we're working to compile and verify information on all these private testing sites to add even more to this map every day. So yet another reason to check out covid19.colorado.gov. In addition to our great uh, blog, uh, the up-to-date statistics, uh, health tips, 
uh, what we have links to the uh, safety rules for stores and for workplaces. You can also find out um, where you can get tested near you. Now on Friday, we started a section called the special shout out. I have two special shout outs today. First, it's teacher appreciation week. So thank you to Colorado's teachers. I know teachers, when you started the year, just like your students, you didn't think it would, you didn't think it would end this way. Um, and our teachers have risen to the occasion to do the online education from home. They had to learn a whole new way of teaching students to make sure that there is no learning gap and those students can master their grade level content and be ready for the next grade level. This year it is even more important than ever before to show our appreciation for all of Colorado's 50,000 plus teachers at public schools, at private schools, at charter schools, at uh, community colleges, no matter where you teach, I want to say Thank you. And I hope that all of you reach out to a teacher that was special in your child's life and make a note to thank them. Send them a quick note on social media, give them a call, write them an email. Uh, our teachers are doing an amazing job rising to the challenges that the coronavirus has brought to Colorado. And I want to say thank you. We want to thank everybody for adopting their work and their lesson plans and their technology setups, our principals, our administrators, our superintendents to keep kids engaged and make sure that just because they can't be there in the building every day, in the school every day, that they're going to continue to learn. I also want to highlight the work of the Colorado Education Initiative and PCs for People. We know that at-home learning often requires equipment and supplies at home. Uh, and, and yet there's tens of thousands of Colorado students who lack internet-enabled devices or hotspots at their home. That's why I'm proud to have partnered with the Colorado Education Initiative and PCs for People, a nonprofit that refurbishes desktops and laptop computers to provide a way for companies and individuals to donate their used laptops and desktops to be utilized for school districts and charter schools. They will take donations of any size, and we encourage you to, uh, to check that out. You can donate by visiting givecomputers.org. That's givecomputers.org if you have an old computer. And we also have information on the helpcoloradonow.org website where you could also make a contribution uh, to the effort. I also want to thank school districts and schools for thinking out of the box and for students who don't have access at home. While schools are closed for the normal classroom instruction, many of them have opened their doors open their doors, of course, to serve meals to people who have no other source of nutritious food, but also for kids who might not have internet access to come home, for kids who need to complete a vocational certificate in a shop class to be coming in in small groups of 10 or less with social distancing to do that. Just because the regular classrooms with the passing time uh, and, and, the, and, and everybody in together isn't occurring doesn't mean that so many schools across the state aren't welcoming students in for one-on-one -on -one special ed services, for small groups, for vocational, uh, and for healthy nutrition nutritious meals. So thank you for schools for stepping up in that way as well. I also want to highlight Animal Protection Week. You know, I think uh, one of the very few silver linings of this crisis is that folks have adopted new furry friends left and right. In fact, our shelters in Colorado are almost empty uh, for the first time that I think any of them can remember. And as great as that news is, we also know that we have many challenges when it comes to the humane treatment of animals in Colorado, including pets, livestock, wildlife, all living creatures in a Colorado for all. We celebrate our biodiversity and we celebrate all of our residents. And you know what? You need to social distance from a moose or an elk or a deer if you see them out there too. That's for their health and that's for your health. Every year we have Coloradans that are tragically injured and some are even killed by wildlife encounters that can be avoided if you simply watch the wildlife from a distance rather than rather than try to go up close. And I know that we're all gonna do that, especially as the bears and other wildlife are emerging from the winters and the deers and the moose, deer and the moose and the elk are coming down from the mountains. Now, some of you might also know that today is a very special day for nerds like me. It's Star Wars Day. May the 4th be with you. You get it? May 4th, may the 4th be with you. Uh, in addition to bringing joy to billions of people, the Star Wars franchise also offers some relevant and compelling life advice that we can all draw from. The first one, wear a mask whenever you go out. You know, whether you're on a mission to crush the Rebel Alliance or whether you're just on a mission to the grocery store, wear a mask or facial covering in public to prevent the spread of coronavirus. Darth Vader would be very safe right now despite his pre-existing respiratory condition. 
and keep your distance from others to at least one lightsaber's length away. It's a good way to keep from getting your hand chopped off and contracting coronavirus. Check out my tie. It actually has the iconic green and uh, red lightsabers engaged in a, a duel there to always remind us to remain a lightsaber away from other Coloradans to avoid the spread of coronavirus. Now, in addition to practical advice from Star Wars, may the fourth be with you, there's also philosophical advice to be had. And I want to share a few Star Wars quotes. The first one is from Obi-Wan Kenobi in episode four. He says, in my experience, there's no such thing as luck. When we look at how the coronavirus numbers are dropping in Colorado, I agree. That's not luck. That's the result of your work, staying home, wearing masks, successfully achieving social distancing. That is what is causing this drop in cases, and it will continue as long as you continue to take that individual responsibility seriously. I know it's difficult, but I know that if we do our part, we will succeed. Second quote is simple. It also encapsulates uh, Star Wars in many ways. This is from the Clone Wars animated series, which I recommend. And the quote is, never give up hope no matter how dark things seem. No one is giving up hope. Things may seem dark, but these tough times are temporary. You know, there's going to be a day in the not-too-distant future when we can all be together again. It might seem like a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away when we went to restaurants with friends and held family reunions and traveled and had play dates and most relevant today, went to the local theater to enjoy a movie. But I assure you that that day will come again. And the better that we do, remaining six feet from others, doing work safely, wearing masks when we go out in public, the better we do, the sooner that day will come. So keep up the good work. Never give up hope. And may the fourth be with you. I have a few comments that I'm going, questions from uh, uh, social media that I'm going to get to, and then we'll get to the press. The first one is actually a personal, uh, a personal remembrance of Paul Carey uh, posted on Facebook. Uh, Jamie said, this hero took my mom from Greeley down to Anschutz in the ambulance in February of 2020. She was so scared to go without us, but he shared amazing stories about his life, his wife, and made her feel so comfortable. She'll never forget his sincerity. Rest in peace. Thank you for your service. There are so, I was just overwhelmed with so many remembrances of people that Paul touched in his life. Not just those whose lives he saved, but who he also really touched and, and remember him well. Uh, another person, uh, Nikki, said we need a date on restaurants and protocol. You cannot tell us the day before. I assume she works at a, at a restaurant. Um, and, and yes, uh, restaurants need to know about a week before they open so they can have their uh, wait staff lined up, they can have their food supplies online. And no, we don't have that date yet because we need the data of the next couple of weeks to make sure we do that. There will be the guidance. We are working now and we want the input of restaurants across the state on that safety guidance. Restaurants are already open in Mesa County uh, right now. Uh, there might be other counties that are working on countywide plans. But in the meantime, uh, whether that date in Colorado is late May or June 1st, uh, we want to make sure that we can uh, get the guidelines right so that they are able to be implemented successfully so restaurants are a safe place to go. Because even if they were open and if customers feared going there, they wouldn't be doing very well. So we want to make sure that it's done safely, that it inspires confidence in people that work in the restaurant industry, the customers uh, as well. And uh, we're going to get that done as soon as we can, uh, of course, as well. Uh, Carol said, remind people what social distancing is and the importance of a mask. It uh, seems people walking around yesterday don't understand what health researchers are saying. So, uh, look, um, and I, I think I've done this every time I've talked, but yes, please wear a mask. It should cover your nose and your mouth. Uh, and you can get some additional protection if you wear goggles or glasses as well to protect your eyes. Uh, but certainly cover your nose and your mouth. It does a few things. It prevents you from infecting others. It, it prevents large droplets from affecting you. And just as importantly, it prevents you from touching your nose and your mouth after touching a surface that might be contaminated. People unconsciously, without even realizing it, touch their nose and their mouth uh, a couple dozen times each hour. If you're wearing a mask, uh, it helps avoid uh, the danger of the spread. So please wear a mask. Be diligent. Be watchful. Stay at least six feet from others whenever you can. Uh, and together, uh, we're going to get through this as a state, as a nation, and as the world. Thank you. We'll take some questions.
Yes. Governor, the Joint Budget Committee has uh, passed several recommendations to reduce veterans programs funding. So do you know of any cuts that would come to veterans programs and or kindergarten programs across the state? So I'm asking about two different programs. Yeah, so look, uh, families across Colorado are tightening their belts. Um, many families that had two incomes are down to one. Far too many that had one income are, are down to zero. And while we're all focused on the economic recovery, we know it's also appropriate for the state to tighten its belt, just as local government is. And so we're, of course, having a discussion with the JBC and the legislature about where we can make the cuts to cause the least harm to Colorado residents. Um, we're going to tighten our belt, and of course, the state has a balanced budget requirement. Uh, the state's receiving some additional federal aid, but we're going to make sure that we keep that we do our best to keep the programs that are most important to Coloradans intact. Now's not the time, for instance, to let health care insurance rates go up, uh, the importance of the bipartisan reinsurance program, of course. And it's not a time that parents can afford to send their kids to kindergarten or first grade or 12th grade. We need to make sure that uh, we don't target a particular grade, like third grade or kindergarten or 12th grade, and that uh, we're able to continue doing a great job providing the opportunity for our kids in our schools. And of course, we owe it to our veterans uh, to provide the very best quality of care uh, for them, our heroes, that we can. So this is a difficult time. Uh, there's difficult days ahead with regard to the services that the state is providing. But when there's difficulty in the private sector, it's uh, appropriate that the state also uh, tightens its belt, and we try to do more with less. Hi, Governor. This is Vinnie Delchute. I said Bloomberg News in Denver. Uh, two questions, one politics, the other agriculture. First, Colorado uh, received an A on the state report card on the coronavirus response. This report card was issued by a, a conservative group led by economist Stephen Moore, who advises the White House. What's your reaction to that, you know, blue state versus red state? Not agriculture, agriculture. The JBS plant in Greeley, are you worried about more sick workers? And we're hearing that not all the workers were tested prior to reopenings had been a pledge. Thank you, sir. So, you know, one thing that is challenging is when we see something that should never be, should never be partisan, should never be ideological, this is a virus, this is biological, not ideological. Uh, and so I don't think it's ever about, you know, conservative or liberal, Republican or Democrat. We're all in this together. Every governor, Republican and Democrat, every member of Congress is working hard together uh, to figure this out. Uh, of course, I'm thrilled uh, if Colorado uh, hopefully lives up to that A that uh, uh, internationally renowned economists have said that uh, we are doing. And I hope we get similar remarks for our work in protecting people's health. This is a health crisis and an economic crisis. We, uh, I'm going to do my best to make sure that Colorado earns A's in both. Uh, and it doesn't mean that difficult days aren't ahead on both the health side and the economic side. But we want to make sure that Colorado gets through this better than most, uh, protects uh, folks uh, to the extent we can, and, uh, and also uh, helps grow the economy and provide economic opportunity for our residents. Uh, we ran a community testing site. I earlier talked about the community testing sites across the state, about a mile and a half from the JBS plant for a number of days, tested well over a thousand uh, folks there. There's additional testing that's been done uh, at private uh, providers ac uh, across the state. So uh, we have really provided additional testing there. We certainly would continue to encourage JPS to to test everybody that was originally their, their plan. Uh, they, they, when they announced they weren't doing that, and they only tested a sampling. We then said anybody can come by a mile and a half community testing. But testing is an important part of making sure that our, our workers are safe and that our national food security remains intact. So we are also working with Morgan County Health around additional testing for facilities, Weld County Health, and many others to make sure that workers who are not infected can safely return to work and that workers who are infected safely quarantine in addition to the safer practices at work, including mask wearing and social distancing where possible. Um, and these are high grade masks that we're working with the federal government to supply uh, to many of these critical pieces of our national infrastructure. From the room? Yes. Governor, I'm wondering if you could speak at all to uh, rural hospitals that might be struggling to keep staff on. Rural hospitals what? Sorry, rural hospitals that are struggling uh, yeah. to keep staff on may have to lay off staff members. Is so the, the state considering anything to help those hospitals? 
The question was about rural hospitals. Many of them had, uh, have a tough time already in normal times uh, because they have less non-coronavirus procedures over the last month. They're having even a tougher time. Uh, I want to point out that our rural hospitals were, were exempt from our uh, temporary cessation of non-emergency surgeries during the month of April. Now, as of April 27th, which we're a week past that, all of the hospitals are now able to do non-emergency and elective surgeries again. Um, and I think what many hospitals are experiencing is, while some people are getting those procedures done, others continue to delay because they're actually worried about getting coronavirus if they go in. And I want to say that our hospitals are doing a great job keeping their patients safe who are non-coronavirus patients. And if you really need medical services, uh, you're putting yourself at even greater risk if you're acting out of fear right? Act out of caution. The hospitals are taking cautions. You'll take cautions there. But if you need some procedure done, uh, could be related to cancer or heart or whatever it is for your quality of life or for your health, um, you should continue to get that and not let the fact that coronavirus is also out there deter you from getting the medical care that you need. All of our hospitals are experiencing that. Uh, it's important that we don't uh, drop the ball on non-coronavirus health issues because we're so focused on coronavirus uh, in the state of Colorado or nationally. Phone, please. Okay, room, please. Go ahead. Yeah, so, you know, there are always safety regulations in our society. If anybody has been to a restaurant or ran a restaurant, you know, they have a safety rating there. Hopefully it's A. If it's, you know, D, you might not want to go there. Customers uh, are worried about that. So they're inspected. And, and the traditional there's cleanliness, all of these factors, one of the traditional ones that is looked at is not social distancing. It's more about bacterial infection of the food. People are worried about salmonella, hepatitis. Uh, that's why the cleanliness is so important at those restaurants. And restaurants are generally safe. Every now and then you hear one that has a hepatitis outbreak or a salmonella outbreak. But by and large, people are confident in it out. This adds a new dimension. It is still, of course, about salmonella and hepatitis, meaning we have to make sure there's not bacterial infections of the food and there's the proper cleanliness protocols, but it's also about this new added element to prevent the virus from spreading to others, and that is social distancing and wearing masks, right? So as we are preparing the guidelines for restaurants to reopen, again, without that date yet, in Grand Junction, they're already open, uh, and, and uh, we're going to prepare that guidance for statewide and invoke it as soon as we can, um, there'll be additional health and safety regulations, just like there will be in stores, just like the groceries and pharmacies have now had for a couple weeks and hash that out, the bookstores and clothing stores are going to have that too. And yes, it'll be enforced, of course, uh, just as uh, restaurants have been shut down for decades if they were a danger to the health because they had environments that could spread hepatitis or salmonella or other diseases. Now they can be closed if they don't meet the requirements to have a reasonably safe environment with regard to coronavirus and social distancing. So it's nothing new. There's not huge, there's not additional expenses that are being foisted on our small businesses. It's, it's common sense stuff that we're trying to figure out and provide real guidance on, but it's basically trying to stay apart from others where you can and wearing masks when you contact the public. I mean, those are the basic elements. It's amazing that despite all the advances in science and technology, we have some of those same tools that we had during the flu epidemic of 1918, wear masks and stay, stay six feet apart. But that's, that's there, it's because they work. They're, 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 they're proven ways of preventing an outbreak, and, and we're going to be implementing them across the way we, we, we live our lives for the months to come to avoid additional outbreaks and deaths, and also to make sure that we don't further damage or sabotage our own economy. Telephone, please. Yes, Governor. Hi. Mary Ann Goodland with Colorado Politics. Given that the two largest outbreaks in the state are in northeastern Colorado at, at JBS and the Sterling Correctional Facility, why is there no one on the advisory council from East of I-25? Um, we are very engaged with Weld County Health and others, uh, and of course there are many members of our economic recovery from Weld County and from other areas. Uh, and, and part of doing this was a goal to have different sized communities represented, so over 100,000, 
Uh, I don't think we have any uh, uh, in the Eastern Plains. Under 100,000, we do. Uh, and we have a commissioner from San Miguel County down in the Southwest. Uh, we have a mayor from Montrose. Uh, and of course, we're excited to work with our mayors, with our city councils, with our commissioners from all 64 counties in our state uh, as we work to address the outbreaks that are site specific uh, at some of the meat plants as well as community wide. Thank you. The question was, what would have we learned in the last uh, almost two months since the first case, you know, month and a half since some of these distancing measures have been in place? Um, I think what we've all experienced, if you watch, you know, the news, if you're watching, this is a tricky, tricky virus. This is a tricky virus. Almost half the people who get it, if not more, might not even have any symptoms. And they're contagious, and they don't even know they have it. And yet, when people in their 70s and 80s get this, you can have one in five, one in 10, who lose their lives to it. And then you have some people who are, well, most people in their 20s, 30s, 40s are perfectly fine, even the ones who get sick and, and, and they're better a week later. It still can strike down people in their prime, like the 21-year-old baseball player who, who went to uh, Ridgeview in Aurora and, and uh, went to Mesa in uh, Grand Junction, who at age 21 lost his life to coronavirus while his dad got over it. I mean, it's, it's a tricky, uh, nefarious enemy uh, that we have. Um, and yet we're also learning things that help us uh, stay safe. For instance, the testing of asymptomatic people who work with our elderly population. Um, the need, uh, knowing how contagious this is, if you have any flu-like symptoms, to stay out of circulation and avoid spreading this to others. Um, the increasing evidence that masks have an impact in preventing the spread to others and keeping yourself safer and preventing you contaminating yourself by touching your nose and your mouth. So we're learning a lot about this every day. Part of what uh, Mesa and Eagle County, the two counties that are moving forward, as well as as a state, as additional people are going back to work, is absolutely critical, is what we call an early warning system. Um, this virus can be underground and invisible and spread because of so many asymptomatic folks and folks with minor symptoms until it reaches a senior care facility, until it tears through a bridge club in El Paso County, uh, and then you see it and, and there's bodies that pile up. And so we need better early warning systems. So along with people going back to their offices in Colorado, which many did today at half capacity in the Denver metro area, it'll be another four or five days. Temperature checks for larger companies, reporting to the symptom tracker uh, so we can catch those outbreaks and hotspots uh, before they uh, fill up our hospitals and we can act quickly to do site-specific lockdowns and quarantines rather than community-wide or county-wide or, God forbid, statewide. Telephone, please. Hey, Governor, this is John Herrick with the Colorado Independent. Um, there's been a number of issues for candidates trying to get their names on the ballot and also for organizers trying to get issues on the ballot. What are your thoughts on electronic signature gathering in order to get measures on the 2020 ballot? Yeah, there's, there's simply uh, changes that need to be made. We're working on the way that that can be done legally. Uh, for instance, unaffiliated candidates, candidates that aren't a Democrat or Republican, and, and by the way, unaffiliated candidates are, uh, I'm sorry, unaffiliated voters are the biggest group in our state. Um, they have no choice but to petition on the ballot if they want to run for something. Well, guess what? Just because you're not a Democrat or Republican, you have the right to run for office in Colorado. And you know what? Sometimes you get elected, too. Uh, and so we have to make sure there's a way that they can do that. Same with petitions. It's a right under our Constitution. Uh, citizens have the right to petition to have uh, issues advance to voters. So we're looking at a variety of ways that we can figure out how we, can, we won't take one step backwards from our constitutional rights and our rights as citizens just because there's a public health crisis. Yes. So first, with, with, with companies going back at 50% capacity on site, 
uh, along with the guidance we're giving companies, we're saying the 50% that's not coming in physically, you need to prioritize for employees over 65, employees with pre-existing conditions, uh, pregnant women, and that should be well under 50% for every company. Beyond that, the second tier is you should prioritize employees who are the primary caregiver for people in their 70s and 80s as the second tier. So um, those folks, should only come back if they want to come back, if they need to come back. But within that 50%, there's plenty of room to have increased telecommuting. For other Coloradans, uh, it's a fine option for them to remain on unemployment insurance during, during this period, especially with the extra $600 provided under the CARES Act. That's a viable option if that meets your needs and you're able to stay home and stay safe uh, and live off of UI for a period of time, you can do that. Uh, others uh, might choose to be able to uh, take some time where they are working from home or telecommuting or simply not, uh, not going into work because they're prioritized in that 50% of the vulnerable population. So there's a number of options people have. Nobody can be compelled to go to work. That's a very important statement to make. There are different economic options for people that are vulnerable and not yet ready to return to work. Uh, and those include UI working from home and telecommuting, or working in a site where you don't encounter uh, others, um, where it might mean if you were working in retail, you might prioritize from working in stocking in the back instead of being out front with customers. Phone? Good afternoon, Governor. I'm Jesus Carraquel from Noticias de Univision. In Spanish, Governor, if some cities have ordered the use of tapabocas, ¿Por qué no ordena y obliga a todo el Estado a utilizarlo? Uh, el Estado puede pasar esa ley, pero si las municipalidades no lo enforzan, no valdrá la pena por eso y yo apoyo que las municipalidades pasen ese tipo de leyes. Ya es una ley en todo el Estado que las personas que están trabajando en las tiendas necesitan uh, llevar... Uh, tapabocas todo el tiempo que están haciendo algo con los clientes de la tienda. Yes. Hablas español muy bien. Gabriel. Gracias. Gracias. Y... Um, this question is from a colleague of mine, Rob Lowe. He, he talks about a microgen DX, a corporation that offers 5,000 tests a day. Have you heard of this corporation? And is the state considering, or would the state consider hiring them? There, there's, a, there's a lot of testing out there, um, and I hope that they're all talking to our testing team. Uh, there's been other suggestions and companies have said, why not us, why not us? It's, it, in general, we have plenty of processing capacity on the lab side in our state. It's generally about the testing reagent, uh, the extraction reagent up until now, and I think we're making progress on this, the swabs as well. Uh, so it's about all of those supplies. Uh, we have the ability currently in our state with the state lab and private labs to process 10,000 tests per day. Uh, we now have supplies that get us closer to that. We talked about our target for May. We hope to be in the five to 10,000 range for much of the month, uh, getting up towards 8,500 by the end of the month. The fact that we were able to get tests from South Korea, from our own federal government, has been very helpful. Uh, if they have the viral reagent, the testing reagent, I hope they're in touch with our innovation team. Uh, but if they're simply lab capacity, they would just bid out doing the tests. And if they're the lowest price, they'll get it. Otherwise, we go with others to do it. Lo agradezco, muchas gracias. Gracias. Yeah. So uh, they submitted their first set of recommendations a few weeks ago. Uh, we've implemented many uh, through executive actions. Others are legislative. There's a Republican and a Democrat on each subcommittee. It's my hope that they will present uh, uh, thoughtful bipartisan legislation that provides a strong economic response for Colorado. And they're working on their final set of, uh, of, of uh, recommendations over the next few days, which will also include executive action uh, and some legislative recommendations that have both Democratic and Republican support. Final phone question. Oh, good. Final room question. Jesse, go ahead. Yeah, we have, um, you know, when you have a large site-based breakout 
in a facility that's a major employer in a town, it quickly leads to community contagion. And we can work with those county health departments to provide additional testing, logistical support, uh, and help make sure that they're on their trajectory to be able to contain it at the site level uh, early, and that means early detection at the site level, to avoid community-wide or county-wide uh, needs for more drastic measures. Thank you, everybody. May the 4th be with you. Go Broncos.